Good evening. Thank you all for joining us tonight for our Intensive Care Society webinar on antimicrobial stewardship in intensive care. My name is Sarah Scott and I'm an ICM and anaesthetic registrar in the Northern Deanery and I'm delighted to be moderating this session. Tonight's webinar has kindly been supported by an educational grant from BioMeriU and we have three excellent speakers and talks lined up. We have Dr. Abad Hussain, consultant microbiologist in the University Hospitals Birmingham, who will talk about antimicrobial use in COVID ITU. Dr. Stephanie Thomas, a consultant microbiologist from Withenshaw Hospital, who will talk about management of infections in patients undergoing ECMO and talking about the Withenshaw experience. And Dr. Andrew Walden, a consultant intensivist in the Royal Berkshire NHS Trust, and he will talk about how we rationalise antimicrobial use in intensive care. During the three talks, please pop any questions or comments for our speakers into the chat and Q&A box, and then we'll have a discussion following the three presentations. So without any further delay, let's begin with a little bit of a surprise video and then move straight into the talks. Thank you. Hello and good evening, and welcome to this session on antimicrobial use in COVID ICU. My name is Abid Hussain. I am a consultant microbiologist based at the University Hospitals of Birmingham NHS Foundation Trust. We're a large foresight organisation with in excess of 150 critical care beds. These are a mixture of both level two and level three beds split between COVID and non-COVID patients. So I thought I would start the session by reviewing antimicrobial stewardship, which has been defined by NICE as an organisational or healthcare system-wide approach to promoting and monitoring the judicious use of antimicrobials to preserve their future effectiveness. Now, it is the individual's responsibility to review those prescriptions, and that's important on the daily ward rounds. But within ICU, it really is part of a much wider MDT discussion with a triumvirate of critical care physicians and intensivists, microbiology and ID, as well as pharmacy. And together, this ward round not only makes decisions about escalation and de-escalation, but also decisions about duration in these critically unwell patients. Now, antimicrobial stewardship was also summarised by Public Health England in this diagram, based upon their Start Smart Then Focus campaign. Starting Smart is around the correct initiation of antibiotics based upon the site of the infection and the potential infecting organisms. The focus bit is around looking at the laboratory susceptibility reports and also watching the clinical outcome of the patient. Now, when thinking about collecting data in terms of antimicrobial prescribing and resistance, the Public Health England Fingertips website is an open source website where data can be downloaded of local versus national trends. So I've taken the liberty of downloading the data for Birmingham. On the left hand side here, you can see a diagram summarising the use of antibiotics over time, measuring prescribed defined daily doses per thousand admissions. And what we can see here is the consumption of all antibiotics, IV and oral, was fairly static over the previous quarters until the latter part of the 1920 uh, financial year, where there's been a huge increase in antimicrobial consumption, which we feel is all part of the response to the pandemic. On the right hand side, uh, we are looking at the resistance of E. coli found in blood cultures uh, when measured against ciprofloxacin. And what we can see is those trends remain fairly static even through 
the last quarter of 1920. Now, what's interesting is looking at the local data beyond that, there has now been a significant increase in the resistance of E. coli to quinolones. And I think that's in part due to the heavy prescribing of these drugs as a result of the response to the COVID pandemic. Now, when the first wave hit, we had to find some sort of way to assess and identify patients with potential COVID pneumonias. So extrapolating from respiratory medicine, we chose the CURB-65 score, but also modified our prescribing of antibiotics for the most unwell patients to include levofloxacin, uh, which we felt would cover not just atypicals, but also have some increased cover against gram-negatives and pseudomonas. And I think this is probably what's driven the increasing resistance that we've seen in E. coli in our later specimens. Now, the, the question then we have to ask is, why do we, are we doing all this prescribing? And what's the evidence for secondary bacterial infections? So in terms of the evidence, it's well described for flu patients from the SARS-CoV pandemic in 2002, through to the swine flu pandemic of 2009, and then the MERS-CoV of 2012. All of these pandemics have resulted in increasing secondary bacterial infections. And when we think about the bacteria involved, it's the usual su suspects, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Haemophilus influenzae, and Staphylococcus aureus. But interestingly, a systematic review and meta-analysis from the John Hopkins uh, back in 2016, looked at 27 studies with 3,000 participants who were flu positive and found the rates of co-infection between 11 and 35%. Now, the problem with these sorts of patients is the initial clinical presentation of viral pneumonitis and COVID pneumonia can mimic atypical pneumonias with a characteristic fever and dry cough. And certainly when the hospitality sector reopened, there was worry about the potential acquisition of Legionella pneumonophila in these groups of patients presented with severe pneumonias to ICU. Now, an Italian group in the early part of 2020 uh, pulled some data uh, from published cases looking at secondary infections and COVID. It was a descriptive analysis only, and they estimated that the incidence was 1.3% in ICU cases and 0% in non-ICU cases. Now that data was not supported by uh, another examination of the data from QMC in Nottingham. That was 30 studies with more than 3,500 patients where they found 14% uh, co-infections in ICU and 4% in non-ICU cases. So we then have to think about how we can improve our decision making in ICU because it's that decision making about starting or not starting antibiotics, about escalation and de-escalation that help give us very tight control over stewardship. And in this diagram, there are really three arms of that process. One is going to be laboratory diagnostics. One is going to be access to radiology. And, and over the first pandemic, we've now become very astute at looking at CT scans and x-rays and deciding what is or isn't a COVID pneumonitis and of course the clinical diagnosis as well. So when it comes to laboratory diagnostics here on the left hand side we've got a Kefid gene expert machine uh, which is responsible for assessing infections at a PCR level from flu A, flu B, RSV and SARS-CoV-2 and that test takes about 45 minutes and costs about 80 or so pounds. On the right hand side we've got the Biomeria Biofire machine which has got a much wider diagnostic panel as you can see here. The time the test takes is about 60 minutes and that costs 120 pounds per test. Now the antimicrobial challenges in COVID ICU really are that when patients arrive in ICU they're usually already on empirical therapy. The way that we work in Birmingham is that we will triage and place our patients based upon 
a throat swab. So for example, if we know a patient from ED is coming to ITU, we will try and get them swabbed with our Kefid machine. And based upon that swab result, we can then decide if they go into the COVID or the non-COVID ITU. And what we find as well with many of our COVID pneumonia patients is they require increasing vasopressor and ventilatory support. And when this occurs, there is often a, a need to escalate the antibiotics rather than de-escalate. But as I explained earlier on, that triumvirate of the critical care physicians and intensivists, microbiology and ID and pharmacy through a daily ward round of the patients and review of antimicrobials can then facilitate those discussions of antimicrobial management. So what about inflammatory markers? Well, we know that based upon a lot of published literature, IL-6 and CRP have good correlation with the severity of uh, COVID pneumonia, although not all laboratories have routine access to IL-6 measurements. We know that there are independent factors to predict disease risk, uh, and biomarkers are one part of that discussion. In terms of procalcitonin, a study of 95, Jap 95 Chinese patients triage their patients into critical, moderate and non-moderate cases, and they certainly felt that patients who were critically unwell had an eightfold higher PCT serum level than those that are moderate, and they felt that PCT measurement could determine disease severity. But a Southampton study, uh, which looked at just 52 patients, part of a um, critical care QUIP program, triaged their patients into low and high PCT, and certainly found those patients with a higher PCT score, greater than 0.5, had a longer stay in ICU and a greater consumption of antimicrobials. A meta-analysis, um, which was also looking at a large number of cases, felt that if the PCT was greater than 0.5, there was a higher likelihood of progression to critical illness. But what all of these papers agree on is that an isolated measurement doesn't mean anything. It's going to be seal measurements that will help decide the progression of the patient and importantly, prognosticate their future management on critical care. So we've talked a lot about antimicrobials, but antimicrobials are part of a larger uh, review of infection control. Now, this very recent paper looked at the spread of multi-drug resistant gram negatives during the first wave of the pandemic. This is an Italian study which looked at the colonization of patients with the most resistant gram negatives we have, the so-called carbapenem resistant enterobacteriales. And they found comparing the whole of 2019 with the March to April 2020 um, period, there was a huge increase, an almost ninefold increase in the colonization of those patients. So why is that? They felt prone positioning had a role to play. And based upon local experience in Birmingham, inappropriate glove use, ICU's overcapacity with a lack of social distancing lead to these levels of cross infection. And here is the diagram from that Italian paper really demonstrating the enormous increase in both colonization and acquisition of cases, that's the spreading of this organism around the unit in that March to April period. So to finish off, infection control in COVID ITU is really part of a four pillar approach. We have to look at screening of our patients. We have to look at cleaning of our units, how we wash our hands, and importantly, antimicrobial stewardship. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation to speak this evening and thank you to Biomeria for sponsoring this evening's presentations. So I'm going to continue with the theme of antimicrobial stewardship in the intensive care, but I'm going to specifically talk about management of infection in patients undergoing extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. So I'll give a brief background to infections in patients on ECMO 
I'll talk about the antimicrobial stewardship and treatment difficulties associated with managing patients on ECMO, and I'll briefly mention some antimicrobial stewardship issues which are specific to COVID-19 pneumonitis and ECMO. So infection and ECMO, it can be the cause or the effect. So it can be the primary reason that a patient is put on ECMO, the primary diagnosis, and we have seen many and very private primary diagnoses. We started out as a unit in 2009-2010 for the influenza A pandemic response. We are a heart and lung transplant centre, so we have the perfusionists and the kit needed to become an ECMO centre and we continued on from then. And since then we've seen a real range of very severe infections in patients requiring ECMO. We've seen a number of PVL staph aureus pneumonias, PVL standing for Penton Valentine Leukocidin, which produces a really nasty necrotizing pneumonia. We've seen a number of Legionnaire's disease, We've seen rhinovirus exacerbating underlying respiratory disease. Rhinovirus is the common cold. We've seen severe pneumococcal and pseudomonal pneumonias. We've seen vasculitis as a primary diagnosis with superadded bacterial infection. We've seen adenovirus pneumonia. We've seen PCP pneumonia in a patient undergoing taxane-based chemotherapy for breast cancer. The taxane-based chemotherapies render patients very lymphopenic but not neutropenic so this lady presented essentially with lymphopenic sepsis and that was PCP pneumonia. And we've seen one MERS-CoV and one was surely enough and we thought it couldn't really get any worse than a MERS-CoV on ECMO until of course came along COVID-19 disease and since around about March time we've had two waves of a number of patients severely unwell requiring extracorporeal membrane oxygenation for the management of severe COVID-19 viral pneumonitis. And of course, this is a viral disease which doesn't necessarily need antimicrobial treatment unless there is a bacterial superinfection. And then infection on ECMO. So instead of being the cause or the need for ECMO, being as a secondary consequence of ECMO. We take patients with pancreatitis, with ARDS, we are a burns referral centre, so we take patients with severe burns, including inhalational injuries, and these patients can be put on ECMO. We take severe asthmatics, eosinophilic pneumonias, and of course, COVID-19 pneumonitis. And these patients, although don't need antibiotics per se, because these aren't primary infections, they are at risk of hospital-acquired infections, as is any other intensive care patient. And actually, infection is the most second most common complication after hemorrhagic complications. So what do we see? We see ventilator-associated pneumonia. We see bloodstream infection. I'll talk about that in a little bit. We see urinary tract infections associated with catheter insertions or catheter-associated urinary tract infections. We see surgical site infections. And all of these hospital-acquired infections can progress to sepsis and lead to septic shock. So are ECMO patients any different than routine intensive care patients? Well, they are, as a baseline, critically unwell intensive care patients, but they already have a failed cardiac and or respiratory system. And they do have additional sources of infections because they are on ECMO that need antibiotics. So they have the cannulation procedure, which in my mind is a surgical procedure, and therefore they have the cannulation site. They have multiple transfusions and for the duration of their run on ECMO, they will have the circuit in situ. If they are VA ECMO patients, because we take patients for VA and VV ECMO, they will have an open chest. And so all of these procedures, all of these are additional sources of infection for these patients. This study from the Journal of Hospital Infection in 2009 looked at risk factors for nosocomial infection in patients undergoing extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And what it showed was one of the main risk factors for infection on ECMO was the length of the ECMO run. And this paper showed that if you have a patient on ECMO for greater than 10 days, their risk of infection significantly increases. And certainly anecdotally, we know that if we are still talking about a patient at our ECMO MDT, which is weekly, in the second or the third week, we know that these patients are at huge risk of infection and we need to be very cautious. So how do you manage patients on ECMO when they develop infections? How do you practice antimicrobial stewardship? 
Well, it's very simple. You just make and treat the primary diagnosis. You make sure your patient has a short and ECMO run as possible. And if the patient does develop a secondary complication such as ECMO, you just treat that. And I wonder if anyone has seen these guidelines for the management of infection in patients undergoing extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, in particular the COVID-19 edition edited 2020. Well, you won't because these, these guidelines don't exist. There are no guidelines to guide treatment for patients on extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. And there's many reasons for this, but one reason is basically the circuit itself. And I'm sure you are all aware of the ECMO circuit, but here we have an ECMO circuit and you can see the deoxygenated blood leaving the patient and running through the oxygenator, through the membrane, and then the nice pink oxygenated blood running back from the ECMO membrane back into the patient. And you can see here, firstly, the size of the ECMO pipes. They're much larger than your normal central line. There's a lot of plastic and there's a lot of connections here. And all of this will put patients at increased risk of infection. And therefore, these infections need treatment. And so these patients need more antibiotics. And these antibiotics potentially are there for longer. And another reason is the circuit itself. So the ECMO circuit leads to drug sequestration and increased volume of distribution, which leads to decreased drug concentrations. Alter clearance, these patients are put on the filter when they arrive, and if they are particularly toxemic or particularly septic, they will undergo plasmapheresis. Physiological factors, we've seen consistently with COVID-19 admissions that a high BMI is a risk factor for severe disease. And of course, if you have a patient with a high BMI, dosing becomes increasingly problematic. And disease-specific factors, these patients arrive in multi-organ failure. They are hyperdynamic, hypoalbuminemic and edematous. All of these makes treating infections on ECMO very difficult and makes antimicrobial stewardship therefore very difficult. Hydrophilic drugs are significantly affected by hemodilution. Lipophilic drugs and highly protein bound drugs like flucoxacillin, ceftriaxone are significantly sequestered in the circuit. And what this means is that, for example, the beta lactam antibiotics like meropenem, for example, we have to give at increased doses. So instead of giving meropenem one gram TDS, we'll need to give it two grams TDS. If we give lenezolid, we'll need to give that TDS rather than BD. And if we want to use voriconazole, it's increasingly difficult. Voriconazole is the gold standard for the treatment of invasive aspergillus. And in our influenza A population, we see an increasing number of invasive aspergillus infections. The reason for that is that these patients are oxygenated by the extracorporeal circuit, but they're only minimally ventilated to allow the lungs to rest. So if you have an organism that comes in with the patient, like an aspergillus, sitting in a respiratory tree that is not ventilated out, sitting in a nice warm environment, it will invade. Aspergillus is an angio-invasive organism and likes to invade. So if you get an invasive aspergillus infection in these patients, you want the gold standard of treatment, which is voriconazole. But we know that voriconazole is significantly sequestered in the circuit, which means that it can take days and days for you to get the voriconazole up to a therapeutic level. This means that we will use a dual antifungal regime, so we will add in a second agent, like in a kind of candin or like ambisome, in addition to the voriconazole until the voriconazole level is therapeutic. So that's the way we practice um, antifungal stewardship. And then moving on to some COVID specific problems, this paper from the French cohort published in August of this year showed a really high number of bloodstream infections in patients with COVID on ECMO, 48%. When we looked at our patient demographics, we looked at 37 patients from the first wave and we found that 86% of patients had at least one positive blood culture and one patient had 29 episodes of bloodstream infection. And of course, all of these bloodstream infection need treatment and they will need treatment with high doses of antibiotics. What organisms did we need to treat? Well, Enterococcus fecium. Enterococcus is basically a fecal strep. It's gut flora, so we saw a lot of that. We saw a number of vancomycin-resistant enterococci, very resistant organisms that need broad-spectrum agents such as daptomycin to treat them. We saw a number of gram-negative bacteremias 
Klebsiella, serratus, Entrobacters. Again, these are gut flora and they can be incredibly resistant, which means you need to use very broad spectrum antibiotics in the treatment. Why did we see this? Well, these patients have very long ECMO runs. Um, with these COVID-19 patients, they took a very long time um, to come off ECMO. They were immunosuppressed, they were critically unwell, and we did practice three times weekly blood cultures. So we did pick up these blood um, stream infections potentially quicker than you would normally. There were lots of gut organisms in the blood. Probably this was translocation from the gut into the blood, secondary to gut failure, ischemia, and bowels just not working. But we did also think that there was probably a problem with contamination of lines during interventions such as proning. These patients had very high BMIs. It was probably an element of lo loss of airway protection in proning and deproning and contamination of lines from an aspiration. So now we dress all our ECMO cannula with silver dressings. The problem with a persistently positive blood culture is that it probably means that your circuit is colonised and unlike a line infection in a routine intensive care patient, you can't take the circuit out. So these patients get prolonged antibiotics and antimicrobial stewardship is therefore a real challenge. We opt for preemptive screening rather than presumptive treatment. We aim to pick up an infection and treat aggressively rather than preemptively um, putting patients on antibiotics for long periods of time. And we always say that infection prevention is better than cure. Aseptic handling of ECMOs and washing your hands using care bundles, it's um, much better than having to use antibiotics preventing in infections. In short, it's not easy and I wouldn't be a microbiologist unless I put a picture of somebody washing their hands. Again, practicing hand hygiene is the key in preventing infections in these patients. Thank you and I'll leave you with a picture of the team who actually do all the hard work. This is the ECMO team based at Withenshaw Hospital in South Manchester. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me, Sarah? Yep, can hear you. Yeah, lovely. Okay, hi. Um, uh, and can you see me? Yep, see the slides. Lovely. Okay, hi. So I'm um, uh, hi. Um, I thanks for asking me to contribute to this webinar. Um, my name is Andrew Walden. I'm a consultant in acute medicine, intensive care medicine at the Royal Barch Hospital in Reading. And because um, this is only a ten minute talk. Um, Although it says how we rationalise antimicrobial use in intensive care during COVID, uh, I'm going to focus on one particular aspect of that, which is actually using um, molecular diagnostics at point of care, uh, which I think is, is sort of fairly, um, a fairly new concept. Um, so background to this. So uh, obviously uh, during the first wave, uh, NICE got some guidelines out in April uh, so fireworks going off, I'm just going to show you. Uh, um, um, NICE came out with some um, uh, COVID-19 guidelines in April, and there was a section on antimicrobial use. Uh, I think a lot of the antibiotic recommendations on the right were, were uh, cut and pasted from BTS guidelines, um, and a lot of the advice was fairly generic. So the key messages, all really sort of things that are, 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 are based around good antimicrobial stewardship, uh, and actually based around national sequence, so, you know, regular review antibiotics, um, early de-escalation of antibiotics, switching to IV from IV to oral, uh, you know, and always thinking about stopping antibiotics. Um, but we were just a bit concerned that uh, in light of the data that Abid was presenting, that actually the, the, the incidence of, of uh, bacterial co-infection um, was unclear in this condition. And, and obviously we were at a point in time where no one really knew what was going to happen. But it did feel a little bit troubling, the idea of giving everyone uh, who came in with COVID antibiotics. So we uh, started to think about ways in which we could perhaps rationalise uh, those antibiotics. And then also, um, uh, you know, we were concerned that perhaps a lot of these patients might develop uh, secondary infections later on because they were coming in reasonably early in their condition. Um, and, and then they might uh, develop um, VAPs and HAPs later on. So, uh, so we were interested in that too and, and trying to make sure we got the antibiotics right for that. But just a bit of context, so the reason that I'm talking about point of care molecular diagnostics is that following this Carter review in 2015, 
uh, one of the recommendations was around the consolidation of pathology services. And so in 2016, we lost all of our on-site um, uh, microbiology services. So all our micro specimens basically got spent to, sent to another hospital within our uh, pathology service. And this led to a, a real deterioration in uh, specimens getting lost, uh, increased turnaround times, uh, just really went from having an A star service to a, a kind of C minus type service. And uh, this was very disconcerting. We felt it was affecting the care of our patients significantly. And so we started to look at point of care solutions. And um, actually we started off looking in acute medicine. So we set up, we've used the Barfire devices there since 2016 up as a point of care test. I won't go into details about how to run the test, but it is actually something that is fairly easy to train people to do. Um, and we've got a very good point of care a liaison from BSPS who's helped us to set up some of these uh, devices and, um, and use them in a, in a kind of fairly robust lab-based way. Um, and where we used it initially was actually in meningoencephalitis. So we'd see a lot of patients who come in with query CNS infection, get put on Keftrax and acyclovir when the, the likelihood of infection was low. And so it meant that when we did the lumbar puncture, we could run it through this device. Um, and, and if there weren't any bugs present in someone with a very low likelihood of CNS infection, we could just stop everything and send them home. And we showed that this was cost effective and actually was uh, reduced antimicrobial use. So working off the back of that, actually, we started doing a quality improvement project at the end of last year off an intensive care with a BARFA device looking at using it for um, uh, diagnosing uh, severe CAP and ventilator associated pneumonia. Um, and one of the reasons was that uh, with this um, consolidation of pathology services, our MBAL, we do surveillance MBALs, and our MBAL turnaround time had gone from sort of 24 to 48 hours up to about a week, which is kind of like not really a meaningful amount of time to make a difference to uh, what antibiotics you're going to give a patient. So, so we felt that we needed something more responsive. So we set up this um, uh, device up on intensive care, this biofire device, and we were running samples before COVID. And here, this is the, what the panel gives you. So you, you basically take an MBAL, um, or you can take a sputum sample, you run it through the biofire device, it takes about an hour and 10 minutes to get a result back. Uh, and this is what you get. So you get a panel of uh, viruses, uh, you get a panel of bacteria, uh, the, the more sort of intercellular ones you just get as a being present or not, but the uh, other bacteria, which you can see on the right hand side here, the semi-quantitative bacteria, um, you actually get a, a bin count with these. So this has been validated against um, the, the standard lab culture method. Um, and so it will tell you from the PCR amplification uh, how much of a given uh, bug is down there, which is very useful when you've got uh, polymicrobial uh, colonization or um, infection. And then one of the other useful things is that you also get um, antimicrobial resistance genes. Um, so we would, uh, we would run a test and where we weren't sure what was going on, well, we, would, we would discuss every result with our microbiologist basically, and the uh, antimicrobial resistance genes would help in terms of determining which uh, antibiotic we should put them on. So this was uh, this is where we run we ran this uh, during COVID. So between the third of March and twenty fifth of May. Uh, so this is the ICNAR data for all ICU admissions. Uh, we actually got hit slightly earlier, earlier in Reading than elsewhere in the country. Um, and just to give you some idea of our case mix data compared to national average, uh, so we're very similar on most things except that we had a, a high proportion of women. Uh, we had uh, more Asian people that we admitted and we had a slightly less, uh, lower uh, deprivation index um, and slightly bigger patients, so people with a higher body mass index. Um, and in terms of the Apache 2 scores, so strangely you can see our mechanical ventilation rate within 24 hours was quite low, so we were trying to keep people on CPAP um, and, and avoid early mechanical ventilation, but in spite of this our Apache 2 scores are higher and that probably reflects the fact that we had a quite a serious outbreak within the hemodialysis population in Reading. So we had a lot of patients, uh, hemodialysis patients admitted, uh, who obviously were having renal, renal replacement therapy, uh, but perhaps were just on CPAP as a, as a limit of, of uh, respiratory support. So in terms of the results, uh, we ran 63 BARFA panels during, between the 3rd of March and 25th of May. 
the ages are very similar to what the overall population was. Um, obviously, we couldn't do bar fires in everyone uh, because a lot of patients were on CPAP and a lot of these patients weren't expectorating any, expectorating any sputum. So, uh, so that you have to set this as a caveat. So this isn't a cons consecutive series. This was really just done as part of a quality improvement project and is uh, just what we found. Uh, again, higher proportion of male patients. Uh, we performed 54 uh, BARFAR tests on MBALS and nine on sputum. And of those 54, 37 were negative. Uh, we performed 13, uh, we were considered to be in uh, patients who had, uh, who, who were early in their disease process, so still had community acquired pneumonia and then 50 tests in patients later on in their ICU stay who we were suspecting of having either ventilator associated or hospital associated pneumonia. So the CAT patients, so say, unfortunately, we only managed to get 13 um, MBAL samples, uh, but they were all negative. Um, and uh, obviously this because again, as I've said already, we, I think we tried to keep, we didn't uh, opt for an early ventilation strategy. We tried to keep patients on CPAP. Um, and the median time from hospital admission to uh, getting the MBAL was three days. So again, that just needs to be taken into consideration. Although you would assume that most uh, bacteria you would still pick up uh, using a, a sort of super sensitive PCR test. Um, we compared it to, we uh, were comparing it to the lab, so we sent all these samples to the lab as well, and the concordance between the two was very good. There were a few uh, candida uh, positive results from the lab, which obviously isn't picked up on the, uh, on the MBAL, but these were all very, very low bin counts, so unlikely to be infectious, more likely to be colonisation. Um, and in the 13 patients, uh, this gave the clinicians enough confidence to actually stop antibiotics. And then the other four, I think, because it was just a bit of uncertainty and, and, um, and it was in very sick patients. I think what is quite interesting is if you look at the CRP here, it just shows you that it's really not a very good discriminatory test. Um, so CRP is very high, but as, as we've seen with COVID, actually that's very, very common. Um, uh, so yeah. This is our uh, suspected VAP hat cohort. So again, uh, the demographics are as expected really. Uh, we ended up with 25 positive results and 23 negative results. Uh, the median time from, uh, from ICU admission to suspected VAP was 12 days uh, with an 8 to 21 day, uh, 25th to 27th centile. And again here you can see uh, as a cohort as a whole, the white count and the CRP are fairly indifferent. Uh, and if you break that down and look at it uh, between those that ended up with a positive test but a negative test, interestingly, again, the CRP is actually higher in those who had a negative test than those that had a positive test, uh, whereas actually there did seem to be a little bit of a signal there that the white count's higher, though again, this, this, this is a QI project, so I haven't done any statistical analysis of this. So uh, of the positive results, uh, what we found was in uh, 15, uh, patients there was a single organism in nine two organisms and then in one patient there were four organisms and this is the spread of organisms here so perhaps not surprisingly Staph aureus uh, commonest uh, organism in a third of patients uh, followed by Klebsiella and Pseudomonas and then a scattering of other organisms as well and this was the uh, this were the bin these were the bin counts from the from the individual organisms so um, here you can see uh, that actually what we've also got in here is the, the actual the genes. So we had quite a bad outbreak of MRSA uh, in our unit and you can see that we picked that up uh, very early on in, in the first patient because the uh, gene came back as MECAC uh, and so um, yeah that was, that was very very useful for us just in terms of identifying where the outbreak had occurred um, and sort of um, uh, cohorting appropriately. And in terms of actual uh, decision making and how this affects decision making, um, in the hat vat patients, uh, you can see that in 14 patients, we actually ended up escalating our antimicrobial management um, from what had been started. In 15 patients, we stopped it. Uh, we de escalated in one patient, and in 17, there was no change. And if you look at the um, cohort as a whole, so this is the CAP and the VAT patients, uh, you can see that actually in a third of patients, there was no change to their antibiotic prescription, uh, but in two thirds, it led to some change in antibiotic, uh, antibiotic prescription.
So just a summary, I think using point of care molecular diagnostics is feasible. And I'm happy to take questions on that, how that works. Um, uh, we were basically preparing the samples at the bedside in PPE. Um, we, uh, I think that we didn't really see much bacterial co-infection or cohort, um, although with the caveats that I've stated that obviously this isn't a consecutive series and uh, these patients had often been in the hospital for two or three days before they actually got an embal taken. Uh, Staph oreos seems to be a very common secondary cause of VAP in these patients um, and using a point of care a molecular diagnostic test led to a change in antimicrobial prescription in 60% of our patients. Thank you. Lovely. So thanks to all our speakers who had some really interesting and informative presentations. So we now have time for a Q&A session with all of our speakers. So I see some questions are coming through already, but please add any further questions or points for discussion into the Q&A box. And we shall have a little chat about that now. Okay, so the first question that we've had is, why would prone positioning increase the likelihood of infections such as CPE? And that could be to anyone. Well, um, we, we've certainly got a theory on that, um, and we think it may well be because, as I said in my presentation, that when you prone and deprone, and certainly patients with very high BMI, we do wonder whether it's just the pressure, intradormal pressure, and the, the risk of um, aspiration, loss of airway protection, and then contamination of, for example, lines. Certainly with the ECMO patients, they've all got necklines in, um, and we, we, it's quite obvious when you deprone them that there is contamination from the mouth to the, to the necklines. And we think that that might, might be why. Um, and again, it fits with the type of bacteria that we're seeing. We, we, we're seeing a lot of gut flora. And I think um, certainly sharing our data with the other, the other four units, ECMO units, we're seeing the same sort of bacteria. So Enterococcus, fecal strep, Klebsiella, Pseudomonas, E. coli, which are essentially gut flora. So that, that's our theory. Mm -hmm. And a slight follow up to that is, do you think there's a rule for selective gut decontamination in um, prone patients or in ECMO patients? Um, well, I think the short answer probably is no, because I think microbiologists get very um, concerned about using that because of the potential for resistance. You know, you're using an antibiotic almost prophylactically. Um, which we don't like. So we, we certainly don't use it and I don't think any of the other ECMO units do. And I don't actually know any um, intensive care unit that uses it either. I might be wrong, but... Not in this country. No, we don't use it in Birmingham. Mm -hmm. So the next um, question we have, do all patients who are admitted to ICU with severe COVID pneumonitis need to be treated initially with antibiotics? I think it depends on um, the flow of patients. So for example, in Birmingham, we have infectious diseases physicians at the front door triaging patients in ED. And they will often make an assessment to see if patients do or don't require antibiotics. But inevitably those that do will end up arriving in ITU already on something broad spectrum. So in my presentation, I was showing a historical slide of our practice. Now CURB-65 is not to be used to triage patients. And in fact, we have now gone back to our standard CAP protocol of giving comoxiclav and trazomycin for severe um, COVID pneumonia. So I think it depends really much on the, very much on the clinical assessment, but there will be a proportion of patients who are already on antibiotics when they come into ICU. I would, I'd concur with that. I mean, I think, I think that, um, you know, a lot of it comes down to the clinical assessment as well. We did have, so these were, neither, neither of these patients got admitted to intensive care, but we did have uh, we had uh, three patients who presented with a much more biphasic illness where they'd been unwell, they'd got better, and then they got a secondary bacterial infection with all the symptoms that you would expect from that. So they actually had a productive cough and high fever, and uh, they all had uh, group A strep, actually, interestingly. Um, uh, but I think that it comes down to that assessment at the front door to some degree. Um, and I think we are, certainly in our hospital, we're starting to... Uh, perhaps not, we, we're giving antibiotics, but we, we are guiding with a procalcitonin. So we'll do an early procalcitonin and then 
certainly in the in the, the less unwell patients, we'll use that just to rationalise antibiotics. So if it's below a certain level, we'll just stop the antibiotics. I think it's a bit harder in the ICU patients, especially when you've got someone that's really sick, um, because I think no matter how much uh, information you throw at clinicians, if you've got a really sick patient in front of you, it is very difficult sometimes to say, well, I, you know, I, you know, I, I, I appreciate all the information, but uh, you know, this is a really sick patient, and I, I'm, you know, the, the information could be a false, a false negative, and therefore I'm going to carry on with antibiotics, which I think is what happened in our cohort. So then, a question about the biofire system. If it's very and a very expensive system, and if you feel that you might be saving money overall on your antibiotics, or if the saving is in better outcomes for the patient, or just due to in getting better and more accurate antibiotic treatment early on. So we had uh, with the with the, the the pilot we were doing before COVID, we'd done about we'd uh, done it in about 100 patients and. Uh, we are saving, our cost saving was going to be around being able to stop doing surveillance end bowels, which I appreciate it doesn't happen on every unit, but we've got a history of using surveillance end bowels. Uh, and actually, it's very easy to make that cost saving uh, argument because um, the biofire pneumonia panel costs, um, I can't remember exactly, I think it's around 100, 100 to 120 pounds, uh, but our standard culture end bowels. Uh, they cost around uh, 60 to 80 pounds. So actually, if you're doing two, two of those a week for surveillance, uh, then that's just one test. So what we were hoping is that we'd move to a point where we would get rid of our surveillance end bowels. And at the point, a point, point in time where you think you're going to start antibiotics for a suspected bat, you do your end bowel at that point and find out what, what's down there and either don't start antibiotics if there's nothing down there or uh, start the appropriate antibiotics. Uh, so there's, I think there's a, there's a there's a potential cost saving, and then there's also a um, there's definitely a, uh, a patient care you know optimizing patient care side to it. Um, you know we people have been going on about genomic medicine for about 15 years, and here we actually have the ability to be really precise uh, in our diagnosis. Um, you know at the point of care, uh, and 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 that strikes me as being you know good 21st century medicine. And then a sort of follow up to this, would you recommend using a large multiplex assay at admission or only when you're, ex when you're suspecting an infection later on in a, during the admission? Is that to me or to Abby? To either or both. Um, okay, well, I mean, I think from my point of view, it depends upon how much money you've got and how big your laboratory medicine budget is, um, is the short answer. I think that in our experience for the with the biofire that we've got we're using it much more when the patient gets onto ITU rather than before they get there because I think for us using the slightly cheaper kefir is just for triaging our patients to determine which ICU they end up in once they get there as they deteriorate that's when we start using the biofire so we'll use it basically within the critical care arena and not outside of that but I'm interested to hear Andy's thoughts on that. Well, we, we've got other platforms as well. So we're using the, we're currently using the Samba uh, for our uh, point of care SARS-CoV-2 testing in the emergency department. Um, we have thought about actually using the, because Biofire's actually got a uh, respiratory panel as well as a pneumonia panel. So we have thought about using that as our preferred uh, flu and SARS-CoV-2 uh, platform. But again, as you say, it all comes down to money really, doesn't it? And uh, uh, trying to show that actually doing I think from my perspective, as I say, as well as a keep position and being very tied in with the emergency department, being able to know what you're dealing with at the front door uh, is, you know, absolutely essential. Um, and it's going to be even more essential as, as, as this, as the winter pans out and we end up with flu and RSV and SARS-CoV-2. And, you know, we need this information as early as possible in the patient's journey to know where to, where to, where to put them as well, uh, even within the intensive care unit, but also the hospital. I've had a um, question as to, for any of the panellists, has anyone seen a confirmed atypical co-infection? <coughs> Is it worth dropping, macro, dropping macrolides for um, in these cases? We've seen one mycoplasma infection in, in a COVID-positive patient, um, and that's 
as far as I'm aware, the only atypical infection that we've seen. So we don't use the macrolides, actually. We don't use them routinely. Um, we just use chlamoxicloud or in the intensive care unit, we use keftriaxone because it can be given once daily and there's less nursing intervention needed than the, the TDS chlamoxicloud, but we don't give macrolides routinely. And you can see from our data, we didn't see, we, we didn't have any uh, atypicals at all in, um, in our patients. So with the caveats, obviously. That said. So we, we're, we're using ketraxone as well, actually. Um, so oral amoxicillin, and then when they, if they get unwell enough to come into hospital and require oxygen, they go on to ketraxone. And just a question then for Abid. You've mentioned the potential for an increase in Legionella infections once hospitality opened up again. Are there any other pathogens that we might need to be aware of or thinking of once things potentially start to open up again? So to clarify my statement, so the initial concern was after the country opened up after wave one and where we were in the West Midlands, we were part of a PHA study looking to see uh, if there were unwell patients in ITU and we had to send both urines and BALs to the Central Laboratory in London to look for uh, Legionella and as the uh, as Andy and Stephanie have mentioned you know we sent a lot of stuff down to Colander we didn't see anything positive come back from that. I think in terms of what's going to happen after um, this particular um, lockdown I mean I, I don't know where we are in terms of the seasonality of mycoplasma I know there are there's a seasonal variation of mycoplasma I don't know how that's affected by the pandemic, maybe others can comment on that, but I'm not expecting to see huge numbers of atypicals. I think as we've seen before, common things are common and it's going to be, uh, you know, staffs and strep pneumos and those sorts of things. Thank you. Thank you. So that more or less wraps up all the questions that have come in. Does anyone have any other um, points they'd like to, to raise or anything else they'd like to, to mention before we wrap things up? No, stunned silence. So that concludes our webinar for this evening. Thank you very much to BioMeriu for supporting this event and to our speakers for their excellent talks. Thank you to everyone who's joined us this evening. If you'd like to watch any of the talks or discussion again, you can find them on the ICS YouTube channel and you can also view previous webinars as well as the one from this evening. So please think about joining us next Thursday for our workforce wellbeing webinar. There's details about this on the website. And thanks again to everyone for giving up their time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.